be something as a uh, that is a definitive conclusion, but just a sort of a reflection and a start of an investigation. So uh, for starters, I'm, I'm gonna start with my own story. So yeah, um, as, as, a, as a kid in high school, uh, I remember getting my first Xbox 360 console. And uh, I remember the first thing that it wants me to choose is the name for my avatar. And at that time, I cannot think of I can't really think of a name that really fits myself. So I just used a randomizer in the Xbox 360 app. And uh, that's how I got the name. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, my Discord name is also the same. It's uh, Carity Terror 86. And uh, I, I, would, I would say that this sort of begins my journey into game worlds. So, as, as soon as I, I start playing my Xbox 360 console, I would uh, use this username that is character86 to interact with others in games and also play through these various games uh, on the console. For example, I, uh, during that time, I, I play a lot of games like uh, Alan Wake, uh, Red Dead Redemption, Gears of War, all these sort of different games from different genres. And uh, uh, I, I think what, what is the most important is that uh, even after, uh, you know, the Xbox 360 era kind of dies out and kind of switch to like Xbox One and also PS4, that era, I'll, I'll also use the same name. It feels like um, I kind of did this name and the, the whole experience and memories that attach with it is sort of becomes my own identity in, in a way. So even after I switch to playing PS4, uh, for example, I'll play like, uh, I'm a huge sports fan, basketball fan. So I'll play like NBA 2K and also play a lot of various games. And uh, in, in those games, I will also, I will always like, tell my teammate that my name is this, my, my name is Carrot or Carrot Terror 86. So I always, I always feel like this, there is this other identity of me while I'm interacting with others in games. And this is not to say that all of, all of, all of us have this experience, but it certainly points to some form of connection between identity and virtual worlds. And this is why I'm so interested in, you know, identities and games, and also the connection between your the virtual and physical self, and that's why uh, to further illustrate this sort of connection between uh, different identities in games and also in real worlds, I would I ha I have invited two correspondents to share their stories in games. And uh, the first correspondent is Janie, and she'll be talking about her experience in Pokemon Go. Uh, although the game is rather different from the other games that I have outlined in my own story, it is still a worthwhile game to investigate because there are still a lot of dedicated, dedicated players in the, in, in the game. And also not to mention that we've all, all heard stories of how Pokemon Go players improves uh, their mental or physical health their, for the better while they're playing the game. So I believe the game can be a useful starting ground for examining this sort of personal development and transformation through games. Uh, so without further ado, further ado I would uh, now invite uh, my first correspondent, Jane, to share her experience in Pokemon Go. Hello, everyone. So um, there is a distant fire alarm testing going on, and hopefully it would not be too much of a distraction. So um, thank you, for Jack, for having me. And greetings to fellow players. Um, I am not a gamer myself. I have definitely watched friends and family play video games. 
but um, I personally play none. And um, the only game I play is um, Pokemon Go, which is a mobile game. And um, I have been playing Pokemon Go since um, the day of its release seven years ago. So my sharing today would be focusing on uh, the blending of my virtual and physical self through my gameplay experience. And so um, back when Pogo was released, it was uh, a massive hit in the local community. People would swarm to a location upon the information that um, a rare Pokemon is spawning. And I was the introvert in my group of friends, and I kind of forced myself to tag along for Pokemon catching expeditions because I was simply too afraid to go anywhere far from campus. A couple of years later, when I got uh, my first job, I find myself visiting different cafes instead of sticking to the ones that I'm familiar with so uh, that I can spin like new poker stops, which are these um, hybrid space geo spots in the game. And um, I had this fear of spending time with myself and catching Pokemon while I dine alone and take snapshots with the Pokemon that appeared on a table uh, via AR while I dine absolutely distracted me from all the awkwardness and fear. And um, these memories end up uh, as most of my posts on social media. And um, so this is how I view my virtual self blending with my reality. So the, um, the synchronization goes beyond, for example, like when you're required to wear a mask during COVID and you put a mask on your avatar too, uh, this is way beyond that. So this sounds cliche, but um, as my avatar grew and um, explored the map, I felt growth in reality as well. So some might say that since it's a course of seven years, which is a long time period, and some might say that this goes, uh, that going from an introvert and being timid and easily scared and all that to an extrovert is simply just psychopathology. Psychopathology would do its works, but um, looking back after seven years, I cannot imagine myself being this comfortable with public speech and um, with those things like um, exploring the neighborhood. So um, that would be the end of my experience sharing, it's always humbling to share personal growth stories from gamers, especially avid player, um, players and gamers. And um, I look forward to the rest of Jack's presentation and the discussion session afterwards. Thank you. All right, so thank, thank you, Jenny, for sharing her experience in Program Go. And uh, the, the next uh, correspondent, uh, unfortunately, uh, he is unwell and cannot join us uh, in person, but uh, uh, he, he has uh, given me some uh, notes about the game he's passionate about, and uh, I'll go through it and see if uh, any of the, the, the points that he has mentioned deserve some discussion in the later discussion session. All right, so uh, this is, uh, so so the correspondent's name is Vincent and uh, the, the game he's currently passionate about is a uh, box hole, Inferno, and uh, it is a MMO, MMORPG in which uh, there are two sides of the faction, I believe, and the players are emotionally attached to the factions they they are, they are in, and uh, uh, what, what I found interesting is that, uh, as he noted, uh, players will create, create alt, alt accounts to spy on others, other factions. So I, I believe this is kind of interesting because this speaks to some form of uh, involvement and attachment that is beyond the game itself. It's about affinities and stuff. And uh, so another interesting point that he mentioned is that uh, uh, in the game you can define your own roles and also this role is constantly shifting between 
you depends on your gameplay you constantly shift between between different roles like logistics scouts and infantry and uh, so and 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 the la last part i found really interesting is he, he pointed out that uh players would schedule assaults uh on on different factions and uh they will collaborate using voice chatting and stuff and you, you can speak see that there's this sense of uh, communal bonding between these players and i thought th this kind of bonding is uh, essential because uh, again you you grow and as you interact with other players not only in terms of knowing uh, more more well this mechanics in the game but also you you grow and you know how to collaborate with others so I believe this is also kind of interesting, but all right, so uh, this is uh, the two stories from our correspondents, and now uh, I'll move on to uh, discuss how can we uh, understand these stories through ex existing lenses, and uh, the, the one place that I found the most uh, interesting to discuss is uh, game studies, and uh, so uh, Gordon Kalija, uh, Introduce this uh, idea of autobiography. It is stands for the experiential narrative that is generated during gameplay, and uh, this is to be distinguished from the script narrative or the narrative content coded by the designers. And uh, this sort of distinction is already laid out by, for example, game designer Matt LeBlanc, in, in her in his distinction between uh, immersion narrative and the uh, script and narrative. But uh, Kalija further pointed out that creating autobiographies bi bi demands a process of mental synthesis where players incorporate their imaginings of the game with the game's signs, such as uh, maybe the images and sounds and these sort of semi, semi Uh, I think Jack has frozen, given that I can see in the chat that other people have asked. Um, okay, uh, so we'll pause here for a minute, and uh, I don't know if he will... There we go, I think he got... Here he comes momentarily I think he'll be popping back in is my guess uh so let me uh, yeah this is basically the interface between video and reality VR <laughs> and <laughs> And our experiences. It's right? real life meets tech, which has been Technology really interesting in this conversation. Is pants. Um, <laughs> I think he knows that he's frozen and will be and is going to attempt to rejoin because he's been popped out right. now. And so right. we'll be so we'll watch for him. Um, so it's it's worthwhile to um Oh, there he is. All right. You're still you're muted, Jack. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. The uh, internet uh, is experiencing some difficulties and uh, we, we are back. So yeah, let's continue. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, as I said, um, so uh, because games are fundamentally structured differently than other types of media, uh, we need to understand the media specific affordances that games offer so, so that we can understand why these roles and these signs in the games are engendering these kind of stories. 
So I believe uh, the model that Kalija offers, which, which points to that uh, the, the threefold interaction between the imaginings of the players and also the signs and also the rules are, are really important here. But um, another, another uh, interesting concept that may be worthwhile to examine is uh, the Janemary's concept of procedurality. Uh, it points to the computer's defining ability to execute a series of roles. And on the basis of these roles, a uh, res representation of something can be generated rather than the representation itself. And this is important because uh, uh, the, 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 the games we, that we just mentioned, for example, like uh, Pokemon Go or uh, Mass Effect or other these type of games are all uh, fundamentally structured based on rules. So we uh, need to understand how these rules work before we can understand how players are creating experiential stories in these games. And based on this concept of procedurality, uh, Ian Bogos uh, uh, introduced the concept of procedural rhetoric. And this uh, sort of uh, a expansion of Murray's concept in that uh, he mentioned that uh, these uh, games can present claims to how things work through through the construction of dy dynamic models, and uh, this is perhaps um, most uh, most not notably examined in in the scholar's piece on uh, board games and democracy and how how these board games are uh, on the surface talking about democracy, but they are not. Uh, the roles, on the other hand, are not are not uh, promoting de democracy in a way. So we have to understand how these rules are saying one thing, and on the other hand, maybe the 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 the, the games are uh, mm, the games are saying that it is about something. It is about democracy, but. Uh, on the other hand, the rules of the games are not saying are not are not promoting democracy in a, in a sense. So, uh, yeah, this sort of uh, uh, difference and discrepancy is why we need to uh, keep in mind that uh, the games are fundamentally structured based on rule systems. So, yeah, and the last part I I I want to sort of point out is. Why should we examine these stories? Why are they important? And there are two aspects that I found the most uh, interesting and most uh, known to be, I think. The first part is obviously the growth of uh, the game and media entertainment industry. For example, as you can see from the, the graph on the left, uh, made by Statistia, you can see that video games <clears throat> The global revenue of video games consists of uh, 192.7 billion. And you can see that other types of important entertainment obviously has its own place, but you can see that video games are growing in terms of uh, revenue and also the, the attraction and the ten attention it's getting. So, and, and uh, as you can see also from the, the, the screenshot on the right, uh, it is a report uh, done, done by the video game retail again, and it's saying that players are, have spent a total of 10.4 million years in Fortnite. And this is, this is a really big number that, that speaks to people's involvement in games and how they are spending time in these games and and we we have to understand maybe maybe we people are growing and developing and transforming themselves when they are interacting in these spaces and the second part that is also relevant to what the the the, the first part is that uh this, this is more of a uh, speculative uh Factor, but it is also important because uh, companies uh, in um, in the technology industry and the media industry are developing 
frameworks for the metaverse. Uh, the, the most famous example is uh, Facebook and Meta, but uh, pe people can always say that uh, their, their version of metaverse uh, are, are uh, as, as you can see from the report on the right, uh, the, the people are not really judging the Meta's, Meta's experiment in the metaverse as uh, something that is in a positive light and they, they are uh, taking a hit in terms of financial and also, also uh, reputation wise in taking a hit. But um, there are other companies that are working on uh, their own frameworks of the metaverse that are increasingly successful. For example, like the, the the Fortnite that I just mentioned, they they are they are investing in creating this framework where players or or regular people can uh, join in in this virtual space and interact with one another and create their own unique experiences. And this is important because uh, if one day uh, we all all of us maybe have to in some way incorporate this sort of metaverse existence into our own lives. We need to understand how people have already been doing this in order to understand how we, the, the new pe newer people that may not be that aware of how we uh, engage in activities or interactions in the metaverse. We, we, these, these people can show us how we can deal with this connection between virtual and physical self. So I, I believe this is why we should examine these experiential stories in games. And, and for the last part, uh, I, I would like to engage in discussions with uh, you guys and maybe if possible, you guys can share your own experiences in games and we can talk about it and engage in discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jack. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, discussion time, I believe uh is is uh what we're looking for and in terms of other people's experiences and we are recording so um uh let's open it uh, open the floor up to everyone attending i think there were a few comments in the chat on this um and and dina i know you have some experiences with virtual reality <laughs> in that um uh, you struggle to experience it. And um, honestly, what I do is I have a wonderful friend who is a gamer. And so when I go through games, and I, I have, he will do all the all of the controls and I will hold my eyes like this because anything that moves makes me very dizzy. So I'll go like this and say, okay, what's going on? And he'll tell me, then I'll, he'll say, okay, I've stopped the screen. You can look. Okay, now tell me what's going on. <laughs> so we play together, but it's really so valuable for me to go through other people's experiences of games and have that secondary experience. And that's something that Hannah and I have really been working on is the accessible experience of games what can we get out of it as a core meaning? And then how can we even, if we cannot experience the games directly, can we still be involved in one of these communities and get that wonderful nexus between real life and game life? Jack, do you know what sort of um, work, uh, Hannah's mentioned something in the chat that there are special headsets for uh, blind people to experience virtual reality. So someone else is describing the visuals. Um, obviously there's more to virtual reality than the visuals. There's audio and haptics. Um, uh, do you know what work is being done with the technology for accessibility? 
Um, unfortunately, I, I do not, I am not aware of any uh, technology that has been done in terms of accessibility, but I believe like uh, a lot of AAA games, for example, like uh, uh, the, the ones made by, for example, uh, Santa Monica Studio, The God of War, and also uh, maybe Horizon for, 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 for Forbidden West, I, as I can recall, there are a lot of, a lot of accessibility settings in, in those games that can you, you, that players can tailor to their own needs. For example, like the most uh, obvious example is maybe like turning on the colorblind colorblind settings and some something like that. But uh, as far as uh, some some sort of accessibility technology that has been done in so so that players can access the 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 game world, uh, I'm not. Quite uh, well read on that, but yeah, I believe it's also a very important part to allow players who want to access these experiences but are not able to to access them. Yeah. Yeah, it's very um, interesting. Um, and Tegan is mentioning the whole uh, shift uh, to the metaverse, uh, which is uh, we've all found it somewhat. Um, confusing slash amusing given as as she notes that second life was released decades ago and and all you know we don't we it was all the rage there for a couple of years but um it still exists people are still in it but it's it's not what it once was um and and it's it's really interesting to to think about that when there are quite significant barriers, not in, not just in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of of cost and and barriers in terms of tech, you know, um, I don't have any VR and um, tech and 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 as we were discussing a little bit yesterday, a lot of people around the world uh, only access the internet uh, through their mobile phones. Although obviously there there are um, ways to to use your mobile phones with VR in a limited capacity um so it's it's very interesting thinking about uh why this push is happening and and what it's going to leave behind and and what it's actually going to be used for uh which uh the um Siobhan is saying that it's it's likely you know obviously big time commercialization um excellent does anyone else want to share experiences uh, in virtual reality, talking about either gaming or experiences, we are going to hear from Ms. Breeze about her experiences creating art and, and digital literature in VR. Um, if anyone wants to, if, I know it's it's very early for, for some folks. I think uh, we do have a few uh, from more easterly locations today, in which case it may be rather late. Um, so everyone is sort of dealing with their own sort of, uh, snooziness. Um, ah, here's Yaka. Yaka, would you like to share some experience? Uh, with virtual worlds, uh, not much. I mean, I, I have a daughter which likes, uh, this kind of things I can, I cannot get her out. <laughs> uh, right. There's always the, the science fiction discourse of being lost in in virtual worlds or being addicted and and not being able i mean one of my favorite short stories is um james tiptree jr's uh the girl who was plugged in um and and this if you haven't read this short story it is absolutely amazing it's based on the premise that you know this idea that you can be someone different in virtual reality and is that better than than the flesh version of yourself. And of course we had a lot of that discourse uh, when Second Life um, popped onto the scene and people were leading alternate lives and and uh, alternate relationships and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's really interesting to think about uh, the, the divide between body and, and the sense of self that we get from, from body versus virtual worlds um uh christine says 
uh, that she was talking to Meta late last year about the metaverse and proposed a choose your own adventure story set in different gardens for adaptation into VR. And she got the sense they're groping for ideas and nothing is set in stone. Yeah, I definitely get the, I've, I've, I've seen, I, I only watch uh, content streaming, television content streaming. So while I do get ads, I get very few ads, which means I get them repetitively. And so I get the metaverse ads like ad nauseum. And some of them are, it's like, why would you do that in VR? Like, why would you need to, when you're, when you're all in the same room, why would you use VR together? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so it's really interesting um, to see that, that they, it feels like they barely have a handle on it. Um, but they, they really want to, to generate buzz and get people to spend money on the systems and then develop content, which is perhaps a, an interesting approach and, and um, which makes sense if you know that that he's someone who built who builds platforms and then waits for other people to create content as Facebook is. Um, excellent. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Dina mentioned that uh, the generation divide for, for games. And I believe this is also interesting in terms of uh, also, the case that I mentioned about Pokemon Go is that uh, Pokemon obviously is a, a huge franchise that has been going on for a really long time. And uh, so um, I, I was talking about I, I was talking about it with other friends, and he, he mentioned that uh, his, his parents are also playing Pokemon Go, and they are bonding over their experiences in Pokemon Go because they, they know all the Pokemons. Uh, both, both like the the the, the parent, the, his parents, and also him. Also, they they bonded over these creatures that they all know about and know love about. So I think uh, this sort of generation divide. Um, I, I I think this is an interesting interesting aspect in terms of uh, maybe bonding people over a huge franchise that has been going on in a while and and maybe for for maybe other sort of examinations into experiencing games in different generations i think that they will be worthwhile to examine maybe these huge franchises such as pokemon or others yeah totally makes sense um, I think it would depend on the on the franchise and on the content for sure. Tegan, um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned about parents playing Pokemon Go because when it first launched, it was really interesting. Where I lived in Cardiff in Wales, everybody was playing, and I mean everyone. You'd go down the local park, and there'd be hundreds of people, hundreds that you'd never see out. We talked to kids, we talked to the elderly, all trying to catch all of these different Pokemon. But as time's gone on my generation and younger don't seem to play it anymore but both of my parents who are in their 60s still play and because of pokemon go they now know more about pokemon than i do and i was raised on like the first generation so it's really bizarre for me to have conversations where they're talking about generations of pokemon that i have no idea about but they know everything and they've caught them and now they talk about breeding and candies and everything like this so I think Pokemon Go really does provide an interesting perspective on how generations are split in that way, because I would never have considered that so many years on, they'd still be playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> but here we are, and they're levels above me now. I think I stopped about a year in. Right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about the interjection of my dog there. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, it is definitely interesting, and also I um, also done some research. Uh, I I I've interviewed people uh, playing playing the game, playing Pokemon Go, and um, they all say that um, they 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 obviously like uh, they they can like play with friends and also families and stuff. But um, the uh, what's also in, uh, interesting is that uh, the game is also evolves as as uh, the time goes on, like they are, they uh, for example, like during COVID, they, impl they implemented the remote rating feature. 
and um, for for one of my participants that, that I interviewed, they uh, the the remote rating aspect is really important for them because they can connect with uh, their relatives that are really far away. For example, maybe they are in the UK and uh, their, their relatives are in, in Asia, but they can invite others, invite invite their families to join these races, and they, they can interact with their families through this way. So I believe this is also kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's a, it's a good point that, um, yeah, the, the first gamers are, you know, not teenagers. They're, they're our grandparents now and, and some even older. So um, definitely some technologically interesting did people um dina is asking can we learn promotion lessons uh from virtual reality for elit um in terms of i guess dina do you want to expand on this in terms of commerciality or publishing yeah. or um i wanted to expand on what tegan was saying and i had noticed this phenomenon too um i couldn't see the pokemon thing so i couldn't do it but everyone for a couple of years was playing Pokemon. And I thought, you know what? Pokemon is a very successful electronic literature piece. It may not have the, oh, you know, meaning to it, and it may not have our content, and we may not be able to do a PhD thesis on it, but it worked. It got everyone involved, as Tegan was saying, and it got people outside interacting with the locative art. Imagine Francie's beater hand as Pokemon. Imagine if we had that kind of scale in our electronic literature. I mean, that would be amazing. How can we do it? What did they do that we could possibly emulate, subvert, disrupt? How'd they do that? Yeah, uh, for for me, the Pokemon franchise obviously the 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 most uh, impressive aspect is they they are doing this sort of uh, transmedia storytelling thing where uh, you can see uh, there's a there's a piece of story in in the manga and also in a piece of in the anime and also there are all sorts of collaboration with these sort of events. And, and for example, in the game, in, in the main series game, such as the, the most recent one is Scarlet and Violet, and also, for example, also in Pokemon Go. So uh, the, 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 the most important part, I believe that I can learn from Pokemon, the Pokemon franchise is this sort of transmedia storytelling aspect that maybe can we can put, put into electronic literature maybe yeah great um all right any any other contributions questions um i do note that that siobhan has noted um utm's sid bolton collection of fourteen thousand game titles uh, which their students have access to, which is kind of a, a time machine, those peripherals, consoles, zines. Um, uh, yeah, so there's this is U University of Toronto I'm taking from the URL. Sorry, um, I'm not great with acronyms. Um, so it's it's good to see that that um, you know there's there's archives happening as we discussed yesterday archives happening all over the world for for some of these things and i think it's also important to to remember that um so many of especially the older games um aren't just virtual there are physical objects uh and physical elements and and so that embodiment um aspect is uh, is really important and something that uh, we tend to to lose track of as we we sort of dive into you know everything being virtual. Um, I was thinking about I watching one of the one of the metaverse ads that I see a lot is the I don't know if y'all have seen this 
um, the the music where they're in, sort of doing a music studio and all of their controls for um, the different instruments, they're all in the same room, um, but all of their controls for the different instruments are virtual. They're doing that sort of the mixing and virtual reality. And I think about um, some of the documentaries that I've seen about uh, different soundboards and different studios and how much they've contributed to the music that we know because they create a particular sound because of the physicality. Um, uh, even though I'm not a music person, um, but, uh, you know, it, there's certain, um, you know, drum kits and soundboards and electronic drums. And um, I think there was some music studio in in Southern California that there's like a Dave Grohl documentary about that, that everybody went there and it was this hole in the wall and, and it was very specific. So um, it'll be interesting to think about how some experiences are very different and will yield perhaps less variable results than their physical counterparts um, as the, the variation is reduced. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, there's a comment in here from Siobhan again, um, looking at critical design history as to pokey stops. Um, in terms of the geolocations, um, the the bias that that may be in there. Um, yeah, that's that's actually really interesting. Is the that sort of augmented, um, extended reality, uh, in terms of thinking about its extensions into uh the actual you know the actual world um really fascinating uh I'll, I'll make sure to copy that that link onto the mirror board it's oh i've got it on the mirror board but yeah and that's the other thing is we're, we're you know I'm, I'm taking a few of the topics on the mirror board but with that i have an interracial family and my stepbrothers were ex who are black works Explicitly forbidden to play locative Pokemon simply because of that issue. And yeah, it's it was a huge barrier. And that's another barrier that we should be talking about in these games as well. There's a lot of bias in the availability of these games for minorities and their sensibilities. And it's it's a bias in creating the games, it's a bias in playing the games, both from a gender point of view and a racial point of view. Noticed it and wonder, Jack, if you had ever seen that, if you had ever encountered that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do see that because uh, I remember also like uh, listening to stories about uh, how like uh, there are some, maybe like people would take advantage of people playing Pokemon Go. Like when when uh, maybe like try to rob them or something like that when they're playing the game. And uh, I do see that, but uh, also the the I think the, the most uh, interesting aspect I mentioned is the racial bias, and this is this is this kind of relates back to what I said about uh, games are based on rules because they, they implement these uh, pokey stops and these stops are designed based on the rule. And we, we have to like criti crit critically uh, assess how these po pokey stops are created based on some, some kind of rules to see that whether they are some sort of racial bias in these, how, how they are creating them. So I believe this is really, really important and yeah. Oh, one one clarification. I'm sorry, my hearing isn't great. Um, role as in the role of the character and the story, or rule as in the rules of the game, the structure uh, the, of the game. The the structure and the rules of the game, because uh, yeah, the, these focus stops are uh, designed based on some sort of algorithm or rules that make them there. So th these rules are, as you said, maybe 
they are promoting some kind of racial bias, right? So we, we have to like critically reflect upon how these uh, focus are, are created, right? Great. All right, fab. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions, comments? All right. Um, so thank you, Jack, for uh, some of those exciting ideas and and leading that fantastic discussion. I'm sure we'll be talking more about uh, VR. Uh, throughout the day as we um, listen to some of our different artist talks and and things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to stop the recording because we've got a uh, YouTube video from Mez uh, Breeze on her experiences creating through VR. And since that's already on YouTube, uh, we don't need to record to to spend the bandwidth recording it. So I'm going to stop that. Um,